So welcome everyone to the first summer of 2020 virtual public outreach of, at Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center. We're excited to have you all with us this evening for the Identifying Cavity and Stick Nests with their Occupants webinar with Ian Fife from Birds Canada. We'll be hosting virtual outreach events bi-weekly this summer, so please stay tuned on Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's website. My name is Sarah Oldenberger, and I'm the Teaching and Outreach Coordinator at Queen's University Biological Station. Myself, along with uh, our wonderful Outreach and Stewardship interns, Lindsay and Megan, will be facilitating this event tonight. We ask that you keep your audio and video turned off throughout the webinar and type your questions into the chat box. So the icon is located at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, we just ask that for the, the betterment of the Zoom, as sometimes background audio and uh, video can cause disruption. So please note that we'll be recording this webinar. We've already started. Um, and it will be available after this presentation. So in case you're interested, we are going to be recording this and hosting it on YouTube. Um, so it will be available for you after the presentation in case you need to leave early or if you'd like to share it with your friends or networks. So before we begin our webinar, Adam Morcom, who's our operations manager at Elbow Lake, will be providing us with an acknowledgement of territory. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Adam. Bonjour, Annie. Adam in Desnikas, Kingston in the Elbow Lake in Danoki. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and is part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of this land and the people who lived here and continue to live here today. The cultures and spiritualities of Indigenous people are connected to the land, and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots, and there is also a significant Métis community and First Peoples from across other nation, from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. Shima Gwich. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, it is now time for me to introduce you to our special guest tonight, Ian Fife from Birds Canada. Ian is an avian ecologist with an interest in human and bird interactions. As an ecologist, Ian is especially interested in how and why birds cho choose the habitat they do. He has about 15 years of field experience working primarily with birds throughout North America in ecosystems ranging from the Arctic to the prairies and now the Carolinian Forest as the program coordinator for the Ontario Forest Birds Program of Birds Canada, with Birds Canada rather. In Ian's current position, they monitor populations and complete habitat surveys of four of Canada's most at-risk birds in Southern Ontario. The most relevant experience Ian has with respect to knowledge about identifying bird nests are the two and a half years at Trent University as a master's student studying the direct effects of forestry activity on breeding, bir breeding forest birds. Ian spent two field seasons searching for and monitoring as many bird nests as possible to determine how many, for to determine how many nests had been destroyed by this activity or if forestry activity had an impact on an adult pair's ability to successfully complete their breeding process. Over, over two years, Ian was able to successfully find over 400 bird nests. Additionally, in his current position, he is looking for and monitoring species at risk nests to determine how productive they are each year. So without any further ado, please help me to welcome Ian Fife from Birds Canada. And so Ian, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. I'm gonna end my slideshow. All right, I'm um, hoping everybody can see my screen here. Um, I will keep my video up uh, my yeah my video up uh, for uh, for this little introduction here, but then uh, I'll stop sharing my video uh, uh, after that, just to kind of uh, so you're not distracted by me talking rather than uh, rather than the presentation. So so thank you, thank you all for joining us this uh, this evening um, and joining in this webinar, and thank you for. Um, for the Elbow Lake community to uh, to put this webinar on. Um, I will talk about uh, cavity and stick nest identification and 
and I hope this I hope this webinar will be informative and instructive. Um, it is a heavily in, instructive and information-based webinar. I hope I don't come across too monotonic or robotic when I'm uh, when I'm speaking, but the the, the webinar itself is repetitive in its structure, and that's just to maintain some consistency between bird species in hopes of easier retention of the information. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. As I said, it's a very heavy information-based webinar. Um, I encourage you all to use the screenshot option if there's a particular slide that you want to save. Um, I do move through the, uh, through the slides uh, rather quickly. Um, the other thing is feel free to add a comment or question in the chat box at any time. Uh, I'll go through the comments and questions at the end of each segment and do my best to answer those questions. Um, I, I won't be monitoring the chat box. I think Sarah is going to be monitoring uh, the chat box uh, So while I'm speaking. So uh, I do encourage people to respond to questions. Um, I do want people to uh, encourage people to respond to questions, especially if they're asking for uh, some type of clarification uh, about something that I've said or uh, and something that may not be intuitive to everyone. So for this webinar, I'll go through some key bird identification features, uh, followed either by other ways to identify bird, uh, the bird through some of their behaviors or a comparison to some similar species or provide some, just some interesting fact about that species. I'll follow bird ID up with some breeding periods for each species and that'll be specifically for Ontario. And that'll be based from, based off of data that was collected by citizen scientists uh, for citizen scientists for Project Best Watch. Um, we'll follow the breeding period information up with um, information about discussing preferred nesting habitat uh, for each species and finally how to identify their cavity and stick nests. Uh, I'll allot about five to ten minutes of questions between these two segments and uh, okay so uh, We'll start this webinar for cavity answers, and thank you very much for your patience, everyone. Um, this obviously isn't an exhaustive list of cavity species. Uh, I did try to focus on some of the more common species you'd find, uh, as well as uh, a particular important species at risk. All right, so uh, a lot of species to cover, so let's get started. Um, the pileated woodpecker is the largest woodpecker in North America, most easily identified by its bright red crest and striped black and white head. The males have a red mustache directly behind their bill and the females don't have a mustache. Uh, their body is dull and completely black. In flight overhead, the pileated woodpecker can be identified by their large body and uh, white underwings near the front edge of those wings. And another way you can identify pileated woodpeckers are, uh, and woodpeckers in general really, is their flight pattern. So pileated woodpeckers are really strong flyers with a slightly undulating flight pattern. The flight is rather slow, but it's vigorous and direct. And given that large body size and undulating flight pattern, they are relatively easy to identify in flight if you get a good look at them. Um, so pictured here is the annual cycle for pileated woodpeckers. I'll show the same graphic for all species that I'll talk about today. The circle displays the months of the year on the outside, and then there are three inner circles, each with different shades of blue. Uh, the outer dark blue circle shows migration periods for the species, and as you can see, there's no migratory period for pileated woodpeckers. They're a non-migratory uh, species, meaning that they stay around uh, all winter. The lightest blue inner circle refers to the species molting periods, uh, but we won't be talking about molting periods in this webinar. So the second inner circle is really where we're going to be focusing our attention, and that shows the breeding period. The two black bars are, are indicate the egg laying and the young stages. So the outer black bar being the egg, leg, the egg laying and incubation stage, uh, which for pileated woodpecker begins in early May and goes to mid-June with the peak egg stage indicated by the bar thickness, and that is, goes from mid-May to early June. Uh, a couple of terms I'd like to define before moving on here, because I'll be using them throughout the presentation, are nestlings and fledglings. So a nestling is a young bird that has just hatched from the egg and is completely dependent on the adult. In other words, it can't feed itself, it can't fly, certainly can't fly, and it can't walk, um, until the point where it begins to grow adult-like feathers. Once they have grown those feathers and become strong enough to move independently in the nest and they begin to stretch their, stretch their wings, uh, they have become fledglings. 
at which point they are usually ready to leave, uh, usually ready to leave the nest within a week or two, uh, or a week or so, depending on the species. So the pileated woodpecker nestling hatch in the nest starting mid-May, and they extend to uh, mid-July, and the peak time uh, is the month of June. Uh, pileated woodpeckers most often nest and roost in dead trees within a mature stand of either coniferous or deciduous trees. Roost sites are typically in dead trees that have multiple cavities, like the one pictured on the right. Multiple cavities give roosting adults an opportunity to escape a predator, and they're also and they're excavated throughout all seasons. Uh, the young pileated woodpecker they'll use large diameter live trees to roost until they locate a cavity, and that usually occurs about a week after they they've left their natal cavity. Nest trees are typically in dead or deteriorating live trees and within a mature or late successional stand of coniferous, deciduous, or mixed trees. Both male and females excavate the cavity. The entrance holes are large and oblong. That makes them very distinct from other woodpecker holes, which are round. The cavity holes are 9 to 12 centimeters high and about 8 to 9 centimeters wide. The tree diameter of, a cavity, of the cavity tree ranges from 45 to 100 centimeters with the average tree diameter around 60 centimeters. And cavity heights are, uh, are typically uh, uh, range from 13 to 20 meters. Uh, the red-headed woodpecker is a very distinct woodpecker with a velvet red head, uh, black back with white wing patches and a white belly. Males and females are indistinguishable. Uh, they, while in flight, those large white wing patches become even more apparent. And also while they're in flight, they have a distinct flying feature. And that, uh, during the breeding season, they are aerial insectivores, that sally from, uh, from a branch to catch insects. So what that means is they, they will be perched on a branch, they'll fly out to catch an insect and return to that same branch to eat its meal. Uh, they are one of the very few woodpeckers in the world that fly catches for their food. The red-headed woodpecker uh, begins laying eggs in early to in early May, and will continue incubating eggs until mid-August in the southern portion of their range. And on, uh, in Ontario, they are usually finished incubating by mid-July. Uh, in Ontario as well, the young begin to hatch in early June, and the young have fledged by early August. Red-headed woodpeckers are considered oak savanna specialists in the northern U.S. Uh, they have a strong preference for open areas with short vegetation. This is presumably because uh, they have adapted this habitat from their ability to catch insects in flight. Um, oak savanna is a very limited ecosystem in Canada, so red-headed woodpeckers have adapted to other ecosystems such as beaver meadows, like the one pictured to the right. Uh, also forest edges to farm and orchard fields where they'll feed on crops and fruit. Uh, they'll also nest in human altered habitat that reflects that preferred oak savanna habitat. So they're often found nesting in uh, public parks and cemeteries and golf courses. They will occupy interior forests as long as there is an open gap coupled with um, many snags and dead branches. So dead wood is extremely important for red-headed woodpecker, not just for cavity excavation, but for roosting, perching, and feeding. Uh, they are weak primary excavators, so the more decayed the wood is, the better. Uh, cavities are excavated in dead trees or dead parts of live trees. Uh, more often than not, cavity trees are snags that have lost most bark. Uh, most often nest, they most often nest in deciduous woodlots, but will excavate in pine if the right habitat is available. And mass trees are also very important for, for fall caching. Uh, so forest composition that includes oaks, beeches, and hickories uh, are enticing for red-headed woodpeckers. The cavity diameter for red-headed woodpecker is about 6 centimeters, and the height of the cavity can range from 5 to 12 meters. Um, the uh, diameter of the tree can be anywhere from 30 centimeters to 80 centimeters diameter, so mature stands are important for red-headed woodpeckers. As I mentioned, dead wood is very important at the nest site. There are at least one to three snags in the immediate vicinity of the nest. Uh, these are all used for nesting, roosting, perching, and feeding from. 
our smallest and most widespread woodpecker in North America is the downy woodpecker. Pardon me, my males have a red spot on the back of their head and the females do not. They have a black and white striped head and white spots on their wings. A thick white vertical bar down the center of their back and their bellies are completely white. Hairy woodpecker and downy woodpeckers are often, uh, are often confused. Uh, while well, the markings on the two birds are, are similar, the hairy woodpecker are about twice the size of downy woodpeckers and have a thick, stout, long bill. The downy woodpecker is another non-migratory woodpecker. They begin laying eggs in early April and continue incubating until the end of June. The young will hatch as, uh, as early as mid to late April and fledge from the nest in late July. Uh, cavities are constructed on the underside of leaning dead stubs of a living or dead tree in the advanced stages of heart rot. Uh, cavities are excavated in trees that are infected with a fungus and that just makes the wood, <coughs> excuse me, that makes the wood easier to excavate. Nests are found in relatively open areas. The diameter of the cavity tree ranges from 15 to 60 centimeters in diameter. The cavity height ranges from anywhere from one to 10 meters high. Uh, cavity hole is, the cavity hole is very small and is about three to four centimeters in diameter. One of our most recognizable birds is the black-capped chickadee. It's a small, compact bird. The males and females look the same. The, they, their heads have a black cap and a bib with white cheeks. Uh, the a gray back and long gray tail and a and buffy colored sides with a white belly. Uh, they are quite willing to feed from your hands. Uh, very curious and brave for being such a tiny bird. <clears throat> Excuse me. The black capped chickadee begin laying eggs in early April and continue incubation through to mid July, and the young hatch as early as the beginning of May and fledge from the nest in late July. They often nest in birch and alder trees, excavating their own nests in dead snags or rotten branches. And they will use nest boxes, but they prefer to excavate wood shavings over using an empty box. Uh, nest trees average about 20 centimeters in diameter. The cavity height can range anywhere from ground level to 20 meters, but most cavities are, are between one to seven meters high. So our next species is the white-breasted nuthatch. Males have a black crown and females have a grayish crown. Beyond that, the males and females are, are virtually identical. Uh, both sexes have a white face and breast with a bluish gray back. The feathers under their tails and their sides have a rusty tinge, but the intensity of this color uh, does vary and their bill is slightly upturned. The nut, nut hatches in general are known for walking downwards on large branches and tree trunks. Uh, the advantage of this behavior is to search for prey, search for prey uh, by probing bark crevices and loose bark. Uh, they begin laying eggs in mid-April and incubate until uh, until early June. Uh, there's a very short young period where they begin hatching in late May and fledge as, as soon as a month later in late June. Their preferred habitat is mature deciduous forest, but can be found in mixed deciduous and coniferous woodlands and occasionally in residential areas. Uh, White-breasted nuthatch are rare in spruce fir coniferous forests. Uh, they favor sugar maple, hickory, basswood or beech forest composition and favor woodland edges over interior locations. And, uh, and where there's open areas near the nest. So for example, they'll often nest near uh, water bodies or even roads, um, um, meadows and fields and, and even agricultural fields. So the white-breasted nuthatch mostly nest in deciduous trees. They will occasionally build a nest in a conifer tree, but it's very rare for them to do so. Uh, they use natural cavities or old woodpecker holes to build nests. They may enlarge the existing hole, but they do not excavate the cavity on their own. And they will reuse those cavities year after year. The cavity location varies from five to 20 meters above the ground. And the entrance is three to six centimeters in diameter, but they do prefer the larger end of that range. 
So the white-breasted nuthatch's cousin, the red-breasted nuthatch, have a bluish-gray back and wings with a distinct rufous uh, cinnamon-colored breast and belly. Similar to the white-breasted nuthatch, the red-breasted nuthatch males have a dark crown, whereas the females have a grayish crown. Uh, below the dark crown is a white eyebrow followed by a black eye stripe that extends from the base of the bill to the nape of the neck. The male's black eye stripe is generally darker and thicker. There are a couple ways to uh, identify, tell apart the two different nuthatches here. Obviously, the red breast and the white breast of the two birds. Uh, however, because of that rusty tinge of the white breasted nuthatch, people can be confused sometimes. Uh, the other things to look at are, are definitely the, uh, the back of the nuthatches. So the back is mostly bluish green on the red breasted nuthatch. Um, uh, whereas on the white breasted nuthatch, it has a bluish gray back, but their wings have a uh, black with white edging. Um, and uh, the other, another uh, key identification feature between these two is the, is the head and the uh, red breasted nuthatch has that alternating black and white head pattern, whereas the white breasted nuthatch has a completely white head with a black crown. So the red-breasted nuthatch begin laying eggs in mid-April and incubate until mid-July. The young hatch at the beginning of May and fledge from the nest as late as early August. The red-breasted nuthatch prefers a mature and diverse coniferous forest, especially forests composed of pine as pine, spruce, fir, hemlock, and cedar. They are less frequently observed in stands of pure pine or hemlock. Uh, they will breed in mixed forests, but it must have a strong conifer composition. And they are, uh, and when that does occur, they're usually associated. They're usually associated with poplar, aspen, and oak species. Um, in eastern populations, which does include Ontario, uh, they are a bit more tolerant of mixed forest stands and do occur in a wider range of forest types, including pure coniferous stands. Um, poplar and pine do seem to be their preferred nesting habitat, though, their preferred nesting trees, I should say. Uh, unlike the white-breasted nuthatch, the red-breasted nuthatch excavate their own cavities. Nest trees are more than likely completely dead or have a broken top. Uh, they are less likely to excavate cavities in dead parts of live trees. Oh, trees with Trees with multiple cavities are a good indicator for red-breasted nuthatch as two-thirds of the nesting tree have two or more cavities in them. Uh, cavity tree diameter ranges from 12 and a half to 112 centimeters in diameter and the nest height ranges from 1 to 32 meters above the ground uh, and they, uh, same as uh, the downy woodpecker it has this very small um, cavity entrance which it averages about four centimeters in diameter. Um, so the kestrel uh, is the smallest North American falcon at only 30 centimeters in length. They are also referred to as sparrowhawks. Uh, they have a bluish gray crown and two black vertical stripes under their eyes. Uh, sex can be determined most easily from the back. Uh, males have a rufous colored back with a blue, bluish gray wings and black spotting. Their tails are rufous colored with one large thick black bar at the end of their tail. Uh, the females have a rufous-colored back, wings, and tail with extensive black barring throughout. Uh, other ways to identify uh, ke uh, kestrels are to check hydro wires while you're in your car. They are quite often hunting from hydro wires over agricultural fields, especially in the winter. Uh, another way to identify uh, an American kestrel is in flight. They show a very typical falcon silhouette, which is a those sharply tipped. Uh, wings uh, and a straight, long, narrow tail. So the extreme ends of the breeding periods here for American Crestro are likely for their southern portion of their range. In this part of the range, the, the Crestro begin laying eggs in early April and incubation is complete by early to mid-June. Nestlings can begin to hatch about a month later in early May and will fledge as late as early to mid-August. They are secondary cavity nesters, meaning they rely on uh, natural or pre-existing cavities made by woodpeckers for nest building. They prefer cavities in large dead snags that are not blocked by overhanging branches. Uh, cavity trees are in open areas, uh, but also nest in woodland edges. 
Uh, hunting perches near the nest are also very important. Hunting perches can include dead branches as well as hydro wires. Um, so the kestrels readily accept nest boxes and will also nest in holes in buildings. Uh, the natural and artificial cavity holes average around seven centimeters. The tree height in natural cavity ranges from two to 20 meters. And nest box height ranges from about three to six meters. Uh, I imagine they probably use a nest box that's higher than six meters, but six meters is most likely as high as people are willing to put a nest box. Uh, the northern sawwood owl, so this is our first owl uh, for tonight. So the, they are a, uh, very, the northern sawwood owl is a very small owl at uh, 18 to 20 centimeters in length. Uh, the only way to tell the difference between a male and female is in the hand. Uh, the females are slightly larger. The northern sawwood owl have a large round brown head with no ear tufts. The crown in the back of the head is streaked white and they have a white V-shaped patch between big beautiful golden eyes. Uh, the adult's tail, wings, and back are brown with white spots, and their belly is white with thick brown stripes. Uh, another very similar looking owl is the boreal owl. Um, the northern solid owls have the white streaking the, uh, on a brown head, whereas the boreal owls have white spotting on a brown head. So the uh, northern solid owl begin laying eggs in early March and incubation ends in early, in early June. Nestlings hatch in early April and fledglings will have left the nest by the end of July. Uh, the northern solid owl will breed in nearly any forest type but more often occupy coniferous forests near riparian areas. The solid owl nest sites are strongly correlated when the number of small mammals are high, which suggests that prey and nest cavities are the two limiting factors for northern solid owls to occupy an area. They are secondary cavity nesters that most commonly occupy cavities excavated by a depileated woodpecker, as well as the northern flicker, which is another North American woodpecker. Uh, because they are adaptable in their nesting preferences, they will accept nest boxes, but, uh, but do prefer natural cavities. Uh, cavity entrances are, are about six to nine centimeters in diameter, and the, their cavity height ranges from two and a half to 13 meters high. So the next species is the brown creeper. It's a small tree climbing bird with a brown back with extensive white streaking through, um, throughout, and that provides some excellent camouflage against the tree. They have a white eyebrow with a long decurved bill and a long stiff tail that provides support as they creep up the tree, and the males and females are identical. The greatest feature of the brown creeper is the reaction when threatened. They stop moving and lay flat against the tree. Uh, making them nearly invisible against the bark. Um, so according to Ontario nest records, brown creepers begin laying eggs in late April and will continue to incubate until the end of June. Once incubation starts, nestlings will hatch in 15 days and begin hatching in early to mid-May. Uh, 15 days is extremely quick for, for birds. It's usually, it's usually 20 to 30 days for uh, for incubation stage. So 15 days is really quick. Um, youngs have, the young will have fledged the nest from in mid to late July. Uh, brown creepers preferred habitat is late successional stages of conifer, mixed and deciduous forests and they're especially common in undisturbed old growth forests. In northern hardwood forests, their abundance appears to be highest in old stands dominated by sugar maple and yellow birch with balsam fir snags. Uh, the brown creepers are technically not a cavity nester, but they do require similar habitat features as a cavity nester in that they need dead or dying trees for feeding and nesting. The nests are built between uh, a trunk and a loose piece of bark. An adult will move in and out of the area multiple times before choosing it as a suitable nest site. The type of tree is really not that important for brown creepers. They'll nest in, or in any, really any type of tree as long as there is loose bark. Uh, the average diameter of the nest tree is 25 centimeters. and The nest height ranges from one and a half to seven meters. And the, those holes are usually just barely uh, wide enough for adults to fit through. 
Uh, our second owl is the barred owl. It's a very large gray-brown owl uh, that is visually distinct from other Eastern North American owls. They have a round head with no ear tufts and a well-defined facial disc and with a dark brown outline. Uh, barred owls have black eyes and a yellow bill. They have horizontal brown barring on their throat and vertically elongated brown streaks on a white belly. The brown back and wings, uh, they have a brown back and wings with uh, white barring throughout. Barred owls are actually increasing their range in North America, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Um, over there, they're hybridizing with the critically endangered spotted owl, and that is causing problems for recovery efforts for the spotted owl. However, in their eastern range, their numbers are declining, and that's due to the loss of old growth forests. Barred owls are a non-migratory owl. In Ontario, eggs uh, are laid in early March, and incubation takes place until mid to late May. Nestlings hatch about a month after incubation begins, and young fledge the nest another four to five weeks after hatching. As I mentioned previously, they do prefer mature and old forest habitat with a well-developed understory to nest. In Ontario, they're strongly associated with tall, unfragmented mixed wood forests and avoid young forests. Um, the old forests provide uh, uh, better nest sites. They have a lower tree stem density, and that's for easier hunting, uh, and also a closed canopy for regulating their temperature and for protection. Uh, the structural complexity of old growth forests also provides a diversity of prey. So, uh, there's also some suggestion as well that the proximity of water is also important for, for barred owls. They are a secondary cavity nester. Pairs prospect nests a year before and select the site the following February to March. Uh, they reuse natural cavities as long as they have not rotted out. There has been one account of uh, a barred owl pair reusing, reusing the same natural cavity for 10 consecutive years. The barred owl prefers to choose larger, taller snags of any type of tree. The nest tree diameter ranges from 47 to 60 centimeters, and the nest tree height ranges from 7 to 13 and a half meters. Uh, the barred owl is a good transitional bird for this webinar because while they primarily nest in naturally formed cavities of deciduous and conifer snags, they will reuse stick nests built by hawks, crows, and ravens. So this ends the cavity nesting portion of this webinar. I'll leave this address up for a second. Feel free to write it down or take a screenshot. I do suggest that if you're interested in placing nest boxes on your property, uh, I encourage you to visit the site. It tells you which common birds will accept nest boxes, gives you plans on how to build those nest boxes, where to place the nest box, including the height, the habitat, and even the direction the cavity hole should be facing. So at this point, I'll take about five to 10 minutes of questions about cavity nesting birds. Uh, feel free to type a question in the chat box. I'll do my best to answer them, uh, after which we'll move on to stick uh, nesting birds. And Sarah, if I could get you to uh, uh, monitor my time, because if there's lots of questions, um, if there's lots of questions, then it, it, we may go over, over our time here. And we'll see what we can do about this moving this window. Does anyone have any questions? If you want to type it in, I'm noticing Adam has mentioned that we have a nest of barred owls in the tree, tree next to our staff house at Alik with at least two babies. And um, apparently the nest has been there for about 25 feet from the lake. Mm -hmm. I guess that, uh, that confirms the proximity to water. So we've got a question here from Ernie. Do any of these cavity nesters have more than one clutch per nesting season? Um, I have to think about the, the birds I talked about. I've also got another mm, question from No. <laughs> it is not, it's not typical for them to what's called double brooding. So um, it's not, typical for them to have two clutches. Um, if they are early and they are able to fledge the young super quick, they may, uh, they may double brood. Uh, it's not common. Um, however, if 
a nest has been predated or damaged or destroyed or anything like that, and it's early enough, they will re-nest, um, and that that they will do um, uh, quite frequently, especially if it's still early in the incubation period. Great. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Ian. We've got another question here from Ruth. It says, for the last two years, we've had chickadees nest in an old window old willow tree, and both nests with either eggs or hatchlings have been ripped apart by a predator. Was there any way for us to help protect their nests? Um, most likely a squirrel or chipmunk, I can imagine, especially if it's near the house. Um, um, to, to protect the nests. Um, I mean, you could try, you could try like a squirrel guard if you know where the cavity is. Uh, around the uh, around the nest, or put up some type of uh, um, structure that the, the the squirrel or chipmunks can get around, it's similar to what you would do with a bird feeder. Uh, that might be some uh, possibilities. Um, but other than that, it's. I mean, I I have to say, I have to say that it's nature taking its course. Um, uh, you know, you want to keep chickadees around uh, they're doing their population is doing well so uh, uh, in terms of uh, them being predated and their population being uh, you know uh, being hurt by by that it's it's not a, it's not a huge issue but if you really want to protect them I would I would think uh, the best kind of option would be some type of squirrel guard similar to what you uh, what you put up for your feeders okay great um, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. I've got uh, one comment before we go into the next question. Uh, the first thing is we're seeing presenter view again, just so you're aware. And then I'll read it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our next question here is from Julie. And I believe Julie's trying to ask, where is a good place to see a white owl in Ontario? A white owl? Or, um, I think that's where my question is. She's asking about saw wet owls, not oh, white owls. Oh, saw white owls. Okay, oh, sorry. Saw it. Where's a good, a good saw wet owl place in Ontario? Oh yes. Okay, Jim. Okay, I see it up there. Um, a uh, good. Um, Thanks, Adam. Uh, coniferous, uh, yeah, coniferous forests. Um, they're actually, they're actually pretty abundant uh, in Ontario. Uh, at this time of year, you probably best to go a little bit more north. Um, in in the winter or at least during migration november october november you can get them in southern ontario um quite easily uh they um they react very readily to uh playing their song so they'll act very territorial even during migration and so you can use uh that to kind of get them to call back to you um so that's so in southern Ontario during migration you can you can get the you can see them uh, and then during breeding periods a little bit more north uh, like um, a little bit more north is probably your best your best chance to see them so like when I say north I'm thinking like central Ontario uh, Algonquin type latitude that kind of area. Okay, great. Yeah, and it looks like we've got a comment from Ernie mentioning that Sawat owls are also found in the Kawartha Lakes. Apparently the McLean Oliver mm -hmm. Center bans them. Um, yes, yeah, actually I've done that with uh, the Oliver Center. Oh, so cool. Trent University there, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, we do get them. That's where we, that's how I know that <laughs> they react very well to uh, their song. Because <laughs> that's what we do. We just play their song and they just go right at the song. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, so I'm seeing our barred owls expanding the range uh, to southwestern Ontario from Julie. Uh, not at the moment, no. Um, uh, no, the unfortunately the forests here don't accommodate. They are, I, I shouldn't say no, they're not expanding the range. They were here um, traditionally, um, but they have, because of uh, the removal of old growth forests in southwestern Ontario, uh, they they kind of disappeared. And I, I, I'm sure you probably, if you hadn't noticed in the range map that I showed for barred owls, the southwestern Ontario portion is 
completely blank of barred owls. They do occur here, they are here, um, but they are almost kind of rare in this area. Um, however, there are changes going on that are focused more on improving forest health and better forest management um, options for, for those old growth forest birds. Uh, so I'm hoping that they will, uh, uh, we'll say expand or um, uh, re, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, so reoccupy the site, uh, uh, southwestern Ontario in, in bigger numbers, which would be nice. Um, are there red-headed woodpeckers? Uh, Maggie is asking, are there red-headed woodpeckers around Kingston South Frontenac? Where would be the best areas to have a chance to see one? Um, the photo that is on the red-headed woodpecker with the beaver meadow, uh, that was taken in Frontenac Provincial Park by myself. So yes, you can definitely see them in the Kingston South Frontenac area. Um, Frontenac Provincial Park is definitely your best bet. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember the uh, not the exact location, but uh, from the southern from the southern entrance, uh, Salmon Road entrance, you can get into Frontenac Provincial Park as well as uh, the north entrance by the Tetsmine Loop area. That's also uh, a good uh, uh, redheaded woodpecker area. All right, great. Thank you so much um, right. for the questions. Yeah. Um, thank you. The, yeah, thank you so much for answering those. Okay. <laughs> and the box seems to have disappeared, but I shouldn't speak too soon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so. all right. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, so uh, we'll move on to our sick nesting birds. Thank you for your patience. Um, you can see that a couple species here I've included together, and that's just because of their similar appearances. I'll discuss the two together when I'm talking about those appearances, and I'll separate them out when we're talking about uh, the habitat and nesting preferences. Uh, again, this is an, an exhaustive list of stick nesting species, but I did try to select common stick nesters that occupy different types of habitat, as well as stick nest sizes and uses. All right, so two birds that most people are familiar with, whether it's through symbolism in classical literature or while spending time outdoors, are the American crow and the common raven. Uh, I'll describe the common, uh, sorry, I'll describe the crow first, followed by the common raven. Uh, the uh, crow is a medium-sized bird. They have a completely black head, body, and uh, wings and bill. Um, the American crow's feather have a glossy violet iridescence to them, and their tails are slightly rounded. Uh, at just over two feet in length and weighing between seven and one, uh, 1,500 grams, the common raven is a very large bird in the corvid family. Uh, their feathers are entirely glossy black with long pointed wings and a wedge-shaped tail. So the features to use to tell the difference between a crow and a raven besides size are features on the head. The crow have a stout bill with bristly feathers near the base of the bill and have uniform feathers over the head, nape, and throat. On the other hand, the common raven have a large chisel-like bill with nasal bristles that covers about half of the upper bill. Uh, their throat has elongated feathers, commonly referred to as hackles, and these are especially prominent uh, on males when the hackles are erected during dominance displays. And of course, the other way to tell the difference between the two are their voices. The crow make a very distinct high-pitched caw sound compared to the deeper croak of a common raven. So I'll describe the crow's breeding period, habitat, and nest preferences first, and then I'll follow that by describing those same features for the raven. So the, ra uh, the crow uh, begin laying eggs in late March to early April, and they'll incubate until mid to late May. Nestlings hatch mid to late April and young fledge as late as mid to late June. The crow uses a wide range of habitat for nesting. There are really only two main requirements for a crow to occupy an area, and that's an open area and trees. They prefer open woodlots over dense forest tracks and use a wide range of conifer and deciduous tree species, as well as shrubs to nest in. The crow is, is, uh, uses medium-sized sticks to build their nests, and right before laying, they'll align the nest with finer materials such as grass, moss, 
uh, lichen, animal hair, and bark. The crow's nests are usually well hidden in crotches and on horizontal limbs of trees and shrubs, but usually near the trunk. Uh, they are more likely to build nests in the upper one third and to one quarter than at the lower levels. However, the height of their nest can vary uh, and range from as low as a half a meter above the ground to 26 meters high. Uh, the average height of the nest is uh, about 11 meters and ranges uh, about a half meter to 30 meters tall. Uh, the crow nests average about 50 centimeters in diameter or about one and a half feet wide. All right, so the common raven uh, I'll talk about now, it's, uh, a it's a circumpolar bird, meaning they're distributed across the world in the northern hemisphere. So there is a lot of geographic and environmental variation in their breeding periods. So I'll, I'll do my best to provide information for, uh, for this area here. So most eggs lay, uh, are laid at the beginning of early March um, to, and, and that extent to mid-April. Incubation is completed to, uh, by mid-June, uh, sorry, mid-May to mid-June. Uh, most, nestlings, most nestlings are beginning to hatch in mid-April to mid-May and the young will have fledged the nest by mid-June to mid-July. Um, ravens are extreme habitat generalists. Throughout their range, they breed in forests, open coasts, mountains, deserts, tundra, and arctic ice flows. They are also very tolerant to humans. However, when they're in forested areas, they do prefer wilderness and will avoid human activities. Uh, generally, they nest in conifer and deciduous forests in middle latitudes, um, and they'll reuse their nest in sequential years and will continue to use it for many years. Nest construction begins with the male bringing sticks to the nest site. Uh, the female does most of the construction. Uh, nests are usually close to the top, but with some canopy covering the nest. Uh, large sticks about one meters long uh, and ranging in diameter from three to 25 millimeters are used for the base of the nest and are broken from living plants or taken from old nests and placed loosely in the crotch of a tree. Uh, smaller sticks are then used to weave and form the cup of the nest. The bottom of the cup where the eggs will be incubated is lined with mud, fur from many species of mammals, shredded bark and grasses. And the base of the nest measures from 40, uh, from 40 to 153 centimeters in diameter by 20 to 60 centimeters high. The nest height itself is about five to 30 meters high. Uh, the red-tailed hawk is one of the most widespread hawks and most common birds of prey in North America. It occupies habitat from Alaska south to Venezuela. It's very similar in shape and size to all other related hawks, but most distinguishable by the reddish tail with the dark band near the tip. Uh, they're most often seen in flight. The reddish tail can be seen through their white underside. In flight, they can also be ID, uh, identified from the dark shoulder markings and dark wing tip marks. Uh, some individuals have a thick dark band that reaches across their belly, but this varies and isn't the most reliable way to identify red-tailed hawks. Um, the reason for that is there are 14 recognized subspecies of red-tailed hawks throughout the range, and they all vary in appearance depending on their location. On top of that, there are color differences within those subspecies. So for example, <clears throat> excuse me, the red-tailed hawk subspecies most commonly found in Ontario which is Buteo jamaicensis borealis, has three color morphs, a light, an intermediate, and a dark color morph. Uh, and these colors also don't include the juveniles. So I, I won't go into further detail here, if we get lost into a rabbit hole here, but, uh, for, uh, but a good Eastern North American bird ID book, such as Sibley's or National Geographic, do have these different color morphs and juveniles for better comparison. Um, in Ontario, nest building can begin as early as late February to early March. The eggs are typically laid in mid-March and will continue to be incubated until mid-June to mid-July. The nestlings will hatch as early as uh, April, as early as early April, and all young will have fledged by early August. Uh, generally, red-tailed ha uh, red hawks breed in open to semi-open habitats, which include mature forests of mixed conifer and deciduous trees near grass and shrublands, as well as agricultural landscapes, and prefer to avoid dense forests. 
in Ontario, especially southern Ontario, nests are usually located near a woodlot edge next to a crop or pasture field. Both the male and female either build a new nest or they'll refurbish our previous year's nests. The nest will be reused for one or more years, they'll so vacate it for another uh, one or more years and then they'll reuse that nest again. Uh, during the, the construction of the nest, the pair are very suspicious as to human presence, uh, which can cause them to abandon the nest site. Uh, so if you're out in, uh, and you notice a red-tailed hawk building a nest, please be mindful, observe briefly from a distance and keep moving through the area. The nests are constructed from sticks about one to two centimeters in diameter and the nest is lined with strips of bark, uh, deciduous and conifer sprigs, poplar catkins and other fine material. Uh, nests are, nest sites are in elevated areas, usually in the crown of tall trees and nests are found to range about 12 to 18 meters high. The nests themselves are between 70 to 75 centimeters or just over two feet in diameter. Uh, these are two very, uh, so these are two very similar looking hawks. The best way to identify them is by their size. The sharp shinned hawk is slightly smaller at 10 to 14 inches and about the size of a blue jay or morning dove. The Cooper's hawk is larger at about 15 to 20 inches in length and it's about the size of a crow. Uh, when, perched, uh, when perched, the sharp shinned hawk has a smaller head and will ma maintain that the, the very rounded head shape. The uh, Cooper's hawk will raise its head feathers and make it appear as though it has a crown on its head. Uh, another way to tell them apart uh, while perched are their tails. The uh, sharp shinned hawk have a squarish tail with a notch at the center, uh, whereas the Cooper's hawk has a long rounded tail relative to their body size with a thick white band at the end of the tail with no notch. The Cooper's hawk and sharp shinned hawks are accipiters. Uh, this is a type of hawk that primarily feeds on birds. 90% of their diet consists of birds. Their prey capture success rate can be as high as 50%. Uh, accipiters have short, powerful wings and a long tail, and that gives them excellent maneuverability for foraging and chasing prey through structurally complex environments like woodlots and that makes them very formidable predators. There are only three accipiters in North America, and that includes the sharp shinned hawk, the Cooper's hawk, and the third one is the northern goshawk. Um, they will take, uh, the Cooper's hawk takes small to medium sized birds and sometimes mammals. Uh, the sharp shinned hawk will take small, it takes smaller songbirds and on rare occasions will take a bird the size of a robin. Uh, some of the secondary food items for a sharp shinned hawk are small mammals, frogs, and insects. So from here, I'll talk about Cooper's hawks, breeding period, uh, habitat, and nesting process, and follow that up with the sharp shinned hawk. So the earliest Cooper hawk, Cooper hawk's eggs are laid early April, and incubation will extend until late May. Uh, their nestlings will begin to hatch in early May, and will have fledged by late July to early August. They occupy deciduous, mixed, and coniferous forests, and deciduous riparian habitat. They are tolerant to human disturbance and fragmentation along with, uh, along with more people putting up, uh, putting up bird feeders. This has made them one of the more popular or populous hawk species in North America. Uh, Woodlots need to be at least four hectares uh, with mature trees with an average basal area of about 30.9 square meters per hectare. They also prefer a nest site with a large amount of canopy cover to protect the nest against weather and predation. Uh, pine plantations are also important habitat for Cooper's hawks. Uh, most important factors for nest site selection is prey abundance, uh, historic nesting success, so whether the nest was successful in the previous years, as well as a complex vegetative structure. So males do most of the stick collecting and place it at the nest site. The females uh, will inspect the process and later use it as a feeding platform before she lays her eggs. Their nests are built with smaller sticks and finished off by lining the cup of nests with bark flakes and rimmed with uh, fresh green tree sprigs. Uh, the average nest height ranges between eight to 15 meters and the average nest tree diameter ranges between 20 to 50 centimeters in, uh, in diameter. Nests that are built in coniferous forests are broader and flatter than nests in deciduous forests. So uh, a nest site in a coniferous forest are about 64 to 76 centimeters in diameter, 
um, and 15 to 20 centimeters high, whereas the deciduous forests are about 61 centimeters and, uh, this, and 43 centimeters high. All right, so the sharp-shinned hawk uh, is, they'll lay, start laying their eggs in mid-April. Incubation will extend until mid to late July. Uh, the earliest sharp-shinned hawk nestling hatch in mid-May, and all young will have fledged by early to mid-August. They occupy mixed conifer and conifer deciduous forests that have a relatively dense stand. Stands range in age from 30 to 100 years old. The conifers are, conifers are most frequently used as nest trees. Uh, these sites are commonly reoccupied, but it's rare for a sharp shin talk to reuse a nest. Uh, they are very secretive birds when it comes to nest locations, and nests are rarely found. Most reports describe nest locations against the trunk or on horizontal limbs in dense, well-developed portions of the crown, well below the top of the canopy. The nests are placed about two and a half to 20 meters high in the tree, and the nest tree diameter can range from seven, 17 to 40 centimeters in diameter. Uh, the nest itself is a platform made of small sticks about 35 to 60 centimeters wide and 10 to 20 centimeters high that is lined with shredded bark and fresh greenery similar to the Cooper's hawk. Uh, probably a species of bird I don't need to teach how to identify as a blue jay. I'll focus on some of the finer details of blue jays often overlooked with common species like this. So their wings and tail have various shades of blue with bold black bars and white tips. The, uh, they also have this the black U-shaped collar across their upper breast and side of their neck, uh, which join a black eye line and borders at the back of the head behind their crest. So I tried to find some interesting facts about blue jays and I came across this quote as it's a description from an uh, early European settler naturalist first describing a blue jay. I thought he really hit the nail on the head with his description. So if you don't mind, I'll just uh, quickly read this for you. So the blue jay is distinguished as a kind of bow among feathered tenants of our woods by the brilliance of his dress and like most other coxcombs, makes himself still more conspicuous by his loquacity and the oddness of his tones and gesture. And I just really appreciated the colorful description the language Alexander Wilson used here to describe um, to describe a blue jay. And I just had to include it and then share it with, uh, with you all. So I, I was able to find some interesting facts about blue jays. Nonetheless, they are uh, monogamous. Uh, they do not hold territories like other birds do, but do uh, defend nests. Uh, they are in the corvid family of birds, so in other words, crows and ravens, and are extremely smart and social birds and will mob predators as a community of birds. Because of their latitudinal distribution, uh, breeding times do vary. In Ontario, blue jays begin laying eggs in mid-April and continue to incubate into mid to late June. Uh, first nestlings will hatch early May and all young will have fledged by mid-July. Uh, blue jays inhabit deciduous forests primarily, uh, sorry, they inhabit deciduous forests primarily, but also coniferous and mixed forests, and especially woodlands with oaks and other large mass trees where they will cache uh, mass nuts for the winter. Uh, they are often associated with woodland edges and utility rights of way rather than deep forest habitat. Uh, historically, blue jays were not associated with urban areas in the Northeast, but over the last 100 years, they've adapted to humans. Uh, some of the reasons for that could be more food to exploit, uh, better nesting resources, and fewer predators, so, so nesting success was higher. Um, they have been shown to become more abundant after uh, group, selection, group selection cutting and small gap openings in contiguous forests. Their nests are constructed from strong fresh sticks and sometimes dead sticks. The sticks used to make the outer part of the nest are taken from live trees and sticks decrease in size near the cup of the nest and the nest is lined with rootlets, uh, dry and wet decomposing leaves uh, birch bark, moss, uh, lichens, and grasses. Nest placement is highly variable. Uh, blue jays will build a nest in almost any tree species, rarely a nest in shrubs, but it can be placed anywhere from the base to the top of the tree and on any part of the branch, including the end, the middle, and near the trunk. Although not common, blue jays will reuse nests the following year. Uh, nest dimensions are about 17 to 20 centimeters in diameter and 10 to 12 centimeters deep. 
Uh, our great blue herons are the largest North American heron, standing about one and a half meters tall. Uh, easily recognized bird, uh, the great blue heron has a long tapered yellow bill. Their neck and back are mostly bluish gray. Their head is mostly white with a thick blue stripe running from just above the eyes and extending to the back of the head, finished off with a fine feathered crest behind the head. Uh, in flight, the great blue heron hold their neck in an S shape and fully extend their legs behind the body. Um, you can also identify great blue herons in flight by their deep, slow wing beats. They, they will nest in, uh, as single pairs, but they're most often they most often nest in colonies, commonly called rookeries or heronries. Uh, some colonies have over 500 active nests in them, and the largest heronry ever recorded had over 1,000 nests associated with it. Heronries are protected in Ontario from disturbance during the breeding season. Usually a one kilometer buffer around the heronry is established around the peripheral nests. Um, in Ontario, uh, the herons begin laying eggs at the end of March and continue to incubate into late May to early June. The first nestlings will hatch mid-April and all young will have fledged by mid to late August. Uh, their occurrence is widespread. They are remarkably adaptable. Um, during the breeding season, they forage in wetlands, water bodies, and watercourses of all shapes and sizes. They can also be found occasionally in upland areas as well. They build nests in trees, bushes, on the ground, and on artificial structures, usually near water. Uh, however, they do prefer to nest in vegetation on islands or in swamps. Uh, heronries are strongly correlated to foraging opportunities and will continue to be reused as long as resources are available. The sticks are gathered by the male uh, from wherever he can find them, including on the ground, nearby trees, uh, trees and shrubs, as well as stolen from abandoned nests of other stick nesting birds. The sticks are brought to the female and she constructs the nest. Uh, they do prefer to nest in trees and nests built in trees are approximately 30 meters above the ground. Uh, the size of the nest does vary as new nests can, can just be uh, half a meter in diameter, while older nests can be one to 1.2 meters across and about one meters high. Uh, so the rose-breasted grosbeak is the only bird I'll be talking about tonight where the male and female have a marked difference in appearance. Uh, the grosbeak is a medium-sized finch. The male has black and white back and wings, a white belly with a large pinkish-red uh, triangle on its breast and a large white bill. The female is olive-brown with dark markings on their wings and back. Cream-colored belly with dark streaks. Their head has a pale brown uh, crown. Uh, sorry, a pale crown stripe and uh, white eyebrows. The rose-breasted grosbeak has been considered both a pest and a beneficial bird, especially to the agricultural community. Uh, they were considered a pest because they have a liking for tree tree buds, flowers, peas, and fruits. Uh, they are considered beneficial because they eat beetles, scale insects, and other insects that damage crops. So uh, they are one of the few species in which the male and female both sing, they both incubate eggs, and they both brood and feed young at the nest. They're also one of the few species that sing while sitting on the nest. Um, pairs do communicate with each other. Males will often sing briefly and a female responds with a chink sound, and that's most, uh, that's most often used to find the female as she forages. Uh, the rose-breasted grosbeak begin laying their eggs mid-May and incubation ends mid-June. Uh, nestlings uh, begin hatching mid, uh, late May and all young will have fledged uh, by late July. The rose-breasted grosbeak occupies a wide variety of habitats in deciduous and mixed forests and rarely found in, con in conifer forests. Uh, they prefer shrubby areas in, in mesic woodlands swamp forests and riparian corridors and avoids dry oak woodlands. They use open second growth uh, habitat in well vegetated areas and rarely found in mature closed canopy woodlands. Uh, they often respond well to light strip and selection harvesting and found in, in uh, habitat 5 to 15 years post harvest and vegetate where vegetation has been restored. Uh, nest sites are in relatively open canopy or subcanopies. Uh, nests are preferred to be built in saplings over tall trees and deciduous over conifer trees. 
Uh, the nests are built in trees. Uh, the nests that are built in trees are found in vertical forks or crotches of trees that can also be, um, but can also be found in shrubs and vines. Uh, the nest is a loose open, cu open cup constructed of coarse sticks and twigs and lined with decayed leaves, rootlets, and hair. Uh, the, nest is off, uh, the nests are often so loosely constructed that you can see the eggs from underneath. Although the, it appears flimsy, the incorporation of the forked twigs and sticks strengthen the nest. So the nest height ranges from anywhere from 1 to 17 meters, and but the average is around 6 meters. The nest dimension ranges from 9 to 20 centimeters in diameter and 4 to 12 centimeters deep. Uh, our third owl is the great horned owl. It's a large owl and the only large North American owl with ear tufts. The long-eared owl is considered a medium-sized owl, so I guess it doesn't qualify here. So uh, the great horned owl has enormous yellow eyes that allow them to hunt for prey at night. Uh, their facial disc is outlined with dark feathers and their neck and throat give them an appearance of wearing a bib. Uh, their back and wings are mottled with brown and black on a gray background and their belly is whitish with dark horizontal lines. The Great Horned Owl Song is the quintessential owl song with the low booming who repeated four to five times and the female also sings but it's higher pitched. So I'll take a moment to share a few interesting facts about how awesome great horned owls are. Uh, they have a disjunct population separated by the Amazon rainforest. The South American population is referred to as the great horned owl Magellanic population. Their overall behavior and identification features are similar to the, the northern great horned owl. Uh, another, important, uh, another interesting fact is that female great horned owls can hold egg temperature at 37 degrees even when the ambient temperature is 70 degrees Celsius uh, colder outside, um, and that becomes more apparent in uh, a few moments here. Uh, so they also have extremely strong talons, uh, which takes a force of 13 kilograms to open. To get a sense of how strong that is, that would be like trying to open the jaws of a German Shepherd. So the great horned owls are very early egg layers with a very brief breeding season. In Ontario, they begin laying their eggs mid-February and incubation ends mid to late March. Um, that's uh, why it's so important for that female to be able to uh, hold that temperature at 37 degrees since they're uh, laying their eggs in February. Um, so the owlet uh, nestlings, they begin hatching late March. All young will have fledged a month later in late April. Uh, so because of great horned owls distribution across North America, they have a wide variety of habitats nest, including deciduous, mixed, and conifer forests. Uh, they prefer open and secondary growth temperate woodlands, swamps, orchards, and agricultural areas. The overall nest site habitat are as equally variable as their landscape habitat preferences, but most nest sites are in trees and snags. Uh, great horned owls are secondary stick and cavity nesters, uh, though through most of its range they rely on abandoned stick nests of birds of prey, most commonly of red-tailed hawks and as well as other hawks. Um, they'll also reuse nests of crows, ravens, herons, and even squirrels. Um, I'll, I'll refer you to the um, red-tailed hawks, the crows, and ravens uh, for those nest dimensions, for uh, nest dimensions and heights. So, uh, the stick nests are usually only used for one season because great horned owls do not refurbish nests and near the end of the breeding period the nest is pretty deteriorated. Uh, natural cavities are used most often and cavity nests are in dead broken off snags and tree bowls in which the top of, which the, top of the tree has been destroyed. So who best to finish off this webinar with uh, than uh, the awesome bald eagle. I don't think I'll need to go over too many ID features of this bird. I think people will recognize a bald eagle. So I'll just point out some key things really quickly. Uh, it is the second largest bird of prey in North America, second only to the California condor. Uh, of course, the white head and tail on the dark body are the very distinctive features, but they also have the light edging to the feathers on their back. Um, they weigh, uh, they weigh, uh, the weight range is uh, from three to six and a half kilograms, and the females are 25% larger than the males. 
it takes a bald eagle four to five years to reach maturity, meaning they will not breed until they are at least four years old. This is one of the main reasons why this species was so affected by pesticides like DDT. Uh, not only did the pesticide cause females to lay in viable eggs, but any nests that were successful, uh, it took that those young birds four years before they can even reproduce. Uh, during, uh, but during this time, uh, these, these many years, uh, they go through these various molts before they acquire that distinctive uh, white head and tail. Um, so the graphic here, that's, uh, that is taken from nesting bald eagles in Alaska, but the dates, dates are relatively similar for Ontario. Uh, the eggs are laid in late March to early April and they'll finish incubation late May to early June. The nestlings hatch late April to early May and fledge in late August to early September. So uh, because of their large size, it takes young nearly four months to fledge from the nest. Uh, the nest tree is usually the largest super canopy tree available with access to limbs that will support the nest. The nest tree will provide good flight access and visibility to the surrounding area. And they'll use any type of tree, but tree selection really depends on the dominant tree species. Uh, the nest is constructed just below the crown of the tree. Uh, their preferred tree species are pine, spruce, and firs in northern Ontario, and pine in southern Ontario, but they will use uh, uh, oak, hickory, and poplars in southern Ontario if conifers are not available. The male and female contribute to the construction of the nest, but the female places the sticks where large branches attach to the bowl of the tree. Sticks are selected from the ground and broken off nearby trees and placed in an interwoven pattern. And the sticks are continuously placed and replaced during the breeding season. Uh, grasses, moss, and other fine materials are used to fill in the gaps between the sticks. And that, that process can take up to three months to complete, but can be completed in as little as four days. Uh, the nest height depends on the canopy of the surrounding forest. In Ontario, the average uh, uh, nest tree was about 20, 28 meters in height and 28 centimeters in diameter. There's usually no mistaking when you come across a bald eagle nest. They are the largest nests of all birds in the world. Uh, nest dimensions are one and a half to two meters in diameter and about half a meter to 1.2 meters in height. Uh, an interesting bald eagle nest fact is uh, a nest in Ohio was used for 34 consecutive years. At the end of that 34 years, it measured 2.7 meters in diameter and 3.6 meters high and was estimated to weigh almost two metric tons. All right, so this concludes the webinar. Uh, I'd like to take a, a moment to provide the resources used for this webinar. Uh, all photos were taken from eBird or, and the Macaulay Library of Images. Credit was given unless they were personal photos. Uh, all species information was taken from the Birds of the World website unless otherwise stated. Uh, most breeding period information was taken from Bird Canada. Birds Canada's nesting calendar query tool through Project Nestwatch and filtered to only include Ontario breeding periods. Uh, breeding periods may vary depending on geography and environment. Uh, most of this information is produced by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, of which Birds Canada is a partner. Uh, so thank you so much for joining in this webinar. I hope that uh, the information I provided it was useful and interesting. Um, at this point, I'll take five to ten minutes of questions about stick and cavity nesting birds, so feel free to type a question in the chat box and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you so much, Ian. It looks like we've got a question from Julie um, who asked and got a little bit of response from folks attending the workshop. But Julie has asked, you said that rose-breasted grosbeaks were finches. Aren't they related to cardinals? Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, yeah, I'm trying to think of the, the lineage now. Uh, there is a I believe there is a relation to cardinals, but they are more closely related to finches. Um, yeah, that's. It looks like we've had a little bit of support here. Um, oh yeah. From Megan, yeah, you mentioned so that uh, I don't know if you can see the comment they, there. They're saying in the cardinal family. So if we're like, talking about cardinal, yeah, family. Um, yeah. Now I'm just. Now I'm just questioning myself now. Um, 
from my understanding, refer to seed eating passerine birds. The family contains distant related songbirds, including both finches and cardinals. Um, yeah, I think that's that's where I'm heading with it. And um, so the information that I got about the medium sized finch is taken from Birds of the World. So I'm 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 going to go with that. Uh, but I do agree that they are related to cardinals, um, definitely. Um, yeah, uh, I'll leave it at that. I may have to correct myself. Absolutely. But I, I'm definitely gonna. I'm definitely gonna be checking on that. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we've got another question here from Reg, who's wondering how would you describe an osprey's nest? Um, osprey's nest is very similar to, um, uh, I'd say like a uh, like a red tail hawk or other hawks. Um, it's it's very similar in size. Uh, a lot of plat like a, people put up a lot of platforms for ospreys, and so that's kind of what I'm focusing my uh, my thoughts on. Um, yeah, it's large, uh, large sticks, large to medium sized sticks, uh, very similar to a red tail hawk um, in terms of how its construction. Great, thank you so much. Um, we've got a question here from Maggie, who's wondering, um, or has stated, on the shore of Big Salmon Lake in Frontenac Park, we saw an enormous nest of really big sticks around and deer fur, perhaps some fur, um, on a ledge on a rock face. We were told it was a raven's nest. Does that sound right to you? Or is there anything else it might be? Um... Yeah, I'm looking at the question. Big salmon lake front now. We saw an enormous nest of deer fur. Uh, Maggie, how high was the nest? I'm trying to think. I'm also trying to think of Big Salmon Lake because I spend most of my summers in Front Out Park. Um, uh, I don't think it's too high. I, I'm yeah, it's hard to say. I, I can't say. It could be a raven's nest. Um, really big sticks could be, I'm trying to think of peregrines would be nesting because they nest on the rock face as well. Um, great horned owls nest on, on, on cliff faces as well. Um, um, yeah, so uh, it's really, it's really hard to, dis uh, really hard to tell uh, from a description. I'm sorry, Maggie. Um, uh, with really big sticks, I'm just yeah. Could be hawk, could be osprey, especially if it's right on the water. Um, uh, could be could be a raven. So uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I can't give you a definitive answer, or, but uh, it could be anything, really. Okay, thank you so much, Ian, for for trying on that one. It's always hard to tell from. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to see a picture. So Maggie, if you want to send it to me, I'd love to see it. Um, and I can always share it with Ian and we can get in touch with you that way if you like. Uh, we've got Julie here who's got a question about where to find a ruffled grouse nest. A ruffed grouse nest, yes. Um, ruffed grouse nests, um, uh, old growth forests, uh, lots of down debris um, because they like to kind of nest in uh, lots of stick, sticks and twigs and stuff kind of piled up and they'll kind of nest around the edge of that. Um, so yeah, just an old growth, an old growth forest. It, it's mixed, mixed woods uh, or, or um, deciduous as well. Um, mixed deciduous conifer, they'll really kind of nest in any kind of old growth forest. But uh, the important thing with rough grouse nests are, is the, the complexity of the, the forest floor. So uh, a lot of down twigs and 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 things like that. A lot of down, uh, a lot of small branches. A lot of down small small branches and things like that. And they nest usually in the on the ground underneath underneath all of that. All right, great. Thank you so much. We've got one question from Mark here. Uh, he says on blue jays, the spring migration period appears to completely overlap. With the egg laying period, any comment on this? Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think that is because some are 
a little bit more migratory and some are not, a little bit more residential. And so you get this overlap with residential and the migration period. I think that's probably the reason for that. Oh, great. That's a great explanation. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got another question here for Maggie. Would we see an American woodcock around here in town in a wooden er wooded area? Um, apparently Maggie saw a ground bird a few weeks ago that wasn't a grouse or a partridge, had a very long beak and a tapestry-like pattern on its back. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a woodcock. Well, that's really cool. You saw yeah. one in town, Maggie. <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone have um, any final I've questions? Seen. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, Maggie said it was fairly low down, just a, just a few feet up from the water. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely not a hawk or an osprey or anything like that, then it could be, uh, could be something like a raven or a crow. Mystery is almost solved. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Speaking of woodcocks, where can I find them? Uh, good question. There are a little bit more open areas. Um, they'll be nest like uh, like adjacent to adjacent to woodlots um, and forests, uh, but they like to present themselves in open areas. Uh, flying up in the air and, and doing their, their flying display. So we've got Peter here who's added semi-open and moist yeah. areas. Yeah, yeah, semi-moist areas. Right. <laughs> and Ernie, Ernie added to easier to hear Woodcock's painting, which is very true, yes. Which is what they're doing when they're in, they're, they're kind of their flying display. They fly around and make these noises as they make these paint, what they call it, painting noises. Oh, apparently there's some back near the marsh behind the Ambassador Hotel for anyone who's looking in Kingston. It's a marshy area, so there's probably great birding in that way. All right, well, we are definitely past time. Does anyone have any final questions mm -hmm. for Ian? If not, um, I will thank everyone so much for coming. And Ian, thank you so much for sharing with us. And oh, thanks to everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for getting through thank the uh, technological difficulties. Um, mm -hmm. And I have recorded this presentation. So if you got admitted late or if you have any, um, if you want to watch it again, I will be posting it on the Cube's YouTube channel. So um, do check there if you'd like to see it. If you have any questions, you can always email me and uh, I can forward them to Ian if he's open to that. Um, but again, thank you so much, Ian. It was great to have you here tonight, and thank you everyone for participating. Thank you.